Did you know that chameleons <coughs> change color not because they want to blend into the environment, but because they want to communicate more effectively with other chameleons? For example, if a chameleon is feeling angry, it'll turn yellow or red, warning the other chameleons that it's ready to pick a fight. And if a chameleon is in the mood for love, it'll put on its finest, most brilliant colors in multi-patterned and, and just to attract a mate. But if a chameleon is ill, it becomes dull and pale, as if it couldn't even be bothered to get dressed that morning. Wouldn't it be great if your spouse had communication like that? So when you came home from work and she, he or she was wearing a yellow t-shirt, you'd go, oh, I need to be cautious this evening. She's had a hard day. But if you came home from work and they were really a really snazzy prince, you'd go, woo, joy tonight. <laughs> Communication is a tricky business. It can be tough to get our message across and share ideas clearly. When we really want to communicate with someone, we have to use words and ideas that they understand. We have to meet them at their own level. Paul did this in Corinth. He became all things to all people so that by all means possible, he might save a few for the sake of the gospel. Paul is described as a man somewhat small in size, with a bald head and bold legs and meeting eyebrows and a large red hooked nose. He was supposedly was quite strong and full of grace. And like many men with a big vision, he was really feisty and passionate. He didn't just feel it was his job to tell other people about Jesus. He felt convicted that he had been called by Jesus on the road to Damascus to tell everybody about the resurrection as quickly and as broadly as he could, and he felt especially called to share the message with the non-Jewish people that we call Gentiles. One of the cities that Paul traveled to was Corinth. Corinth is located on an isthmus between two harbors. It's an international trade center where the sailors come, and where merchants come, and where tourists come from many lands. The culture was very different in Corinth than it was down by Jerusalem, where the Jesus movement had started. And no Jesus missionaries went to Corinth before Paul got there. So he had to go and learn their culture. He had to go and learn how business was conducted in Corinth. And to this end, he became a tent maker. The tents were large, colorful canvas and leather structures that were needed by the soldiers who were brought into the area to keep control. They were needed by the tourists passing through the capital city, and they were used by the merchants to set up stalls and conduct businesses. And as Paul began to work alongside the people in the morning, he was freed up to go to synagogue with those under the law in the afternoon and he was freed up to socialize with the Gentiles. He even ate with them. He even ate food that was outside the boundaries of the Jewish dietary laws in order that he could build connections with them. He engaged each of them in conversation and began to tell the stories of Jesus so that they could hear and understand his goal was not to build a church in Corinth. His goal was to teach the people how to live abundantly in God's realm instead of dying slowly in the Roman kingdom. Paul is just one of God's evangelists, just one of God's communicators. All those apostles 
heard of Jesus healing, and they passed that message on to the first century people, who passed that message on to the next generation, who passed the message on, and today there are billions of people across the globe speaking in every imagination, language imaginable, in every country imaginable, who know about Jesus. The power of God reaches each person in a way that fits their context. It connects with each of us in a unique way, addressing who we are at a particular time and in a particular space. Paul understood this too. He knew that people did not have to become Jewish in order to become Christ followers. His vision wasn't limited to synagogue or to church. It was about redemption for all of the people. Another person that God worked through was John Wesley. He's the founder of Methodism, and he was an ordained Anglican priest. He really respected the Church of England, and he had no intention of starting a new denomination. It was customary of, for the, in that time for people to go to church, but some congregations shunned people. They wouldn't let them in because they weren't dressed right or because they couldn't afford the fee for the pew. So Wesley began to take the word of gospel to the people, and he began to preach in fields and on corners, wherever the people were coming home from work. Not even on a Sunday, that's where he began to preach. He gathered people into neighborhood societies so that they could study the Bible and support each other in small groups. And he urged new Christians to do all the good you can in all the ways that can to all the souls you can in every place you can at all the times you can with all the zeal you can, as long as you can. John Wesley's vision wasn't growing the church. It was connecting people to Christ so they could find, find wholeness and healing. Paul and Wesley could see that people needed the Lord. And so they found ways to become like others so that they could help each person connect more deeply to God. I think that life isn't complete without Jesus. You can have a job and feel productive. You can pay your bills and feel financially secure. You can work out three times a week and be physically fit. You can find the love of your life and raise a family, and yet you can still feel a certain emptiness and incompleteness. You won't be complete until you know that you are loved and guided by God. You need Jesus for your spiritual health. Now, those of you who are sitting here today probably already know that. But who is not here today? Who in your life is still struggling? Who has not found that wholeness and completeness? Or who is actually okay, all right, but still is missing something, even if they can't name what they're missing? Would you like to give Christ's love to that person too? The concept of evangelism is frightening and a turnoff for a lot of us. We've all had an uncomfortable experience when someone else tries to push their concept of faith on us. And many of us feel that faith is a private matter, that it's inappropriate to talk about faith with our family, our friends, and our co-workers. But it's also inappropriate to let them suffer alone, to know where the healing is and not tell them about it. One pastor defines evangelism as one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. So how do we tell people where the bread is? 
How do we tell people how to find freedom in Christ? We could use modern day tools. We could build a website, post to Facebook, text, and tweet. And that would certainly help people find us. But if we want people to find Jesus, we're going to have to share the good news in a more direct fashion. Statistics show that 75%, 75%, three quarters of Christians became Christians because a friend or a family member showed them the way. People are more receptive to the message when the message comes from a trusted friend. And remember, too, that evangelism is a process, not an event. You can't unfold God's truth in one conversation. On average, a typical person needs to hear about 30 stories of how God has worked in someone's life before they will decide to become Christian. Our task, our task, is to be available and faithful in our witness, whether we are the first person to share the good news or the 31st person. Let's change tracks just for a moment and I'll tell you a story. A small town in New Mexico decided to have an auction to raise money to build a community center. And so the town folks searched through their attics and garages and basements and they gathered up household items and trinkets and furniture. On the day of the auction, things went very well and several thousand dollars had already been earned by the time the last item was brought forward. <coughs> it was an old violin covered with dust and grime and splatterings of paint as if it had been in the back of someone's garage for quite a number of years. What am I bid for it, says the auctioneer. Silence from the crowds. Come on, he said, bid something. And someone yelled out 50 cents and everybody started to laugh. And then from the back, an old man came forward. No one knew him. And he stepped up to the auctioneer and he took the violin and he looked at it and he began to play it. And a beautiful sound filled the whole room and touched everyone's heart. And when he was finished, he wordlessly handed the violin back to the auctioneer. The auctioneer turned once again and said, how much am I bid for this violin? 200, 300, 400 came the shouts from the crowd. That violin was just an old instrument worth 50 cents before it was played. And then it became worth hundreds of dollars. Our church is just an old empty building until someone begins to sing the praises of what it means to belong to church. Our Bibles are just old dusty books until together we start exploring in them and find life's truth on the pages. And Jesus is just a stranger until someone introduces you to him by telling you what a difference he has made in their lives, by telling you how faith has helped them. I'm asking you to allow God to play music through you, to allow God to move fully in your life, to move beyond once-week observances or once-a-day prayers in the solitude of your bedroom. Allow God to go deeper into your work in the church and your work in the community because it's the right thing to do. Paul was called by God to travel from region to region to region, reaching out to each person in a way that they would understand to bring them and in, in to the good news of Jesus. We, like Paul, are also called to share that good news of Jesus Christ, to actually tell others about our Savior who comes to meet us, 
the, our healer who affects our lives, our God who makes us whole and continues to change us, making not only a difference in the world, but making us different. Amen.